Good afternoon. I'm Eric Sandine, director of the Wyoming Institute for Humanities Research, the sponsor of today's event. Before I introduce Patricia Nelson Limerick, Patty, let me say a few words about the Institute. And believe me, I am enjoying the fact that I can say a few words about the <laughs> Institute. <laughs> Over two years ago, a group of faculty and professional staff members in and around the humanities began the discussions that have resulted in the Institute. Our mission is to promote, support, and showcase humanities scholarship across the university and the state. We sponsor invited speakers, public events, discussion groups, and both individual and collaborative research projects. Our goal is to connect the UW humanities community with colleagues throughout the state, across the nation, and in international venues, and to engage in critical reflection on the nature and role of the humanities in a civil democracy. This is quite a mouthful, and we hope to fulfill the potential that is so evident in this talented group of faculty and professional staff colleagues. I'm happy to have the public occasion to acknowledge the considerable efforts that have brought us to this point. Myron Allen, then Vice President of Academic Affairs, and especially Carol Frost, then Associate Vice President, encouraged us to develop our thoughts into a specific proposal. We're immensely grateful for their foresight and collegiality. Current academic vice president, Dick McGinnity, has been instrumental in adapting our proposal to new administrative priorities and securing support for the Institute. Oliver Walter, Paul Lutz, and Bill Gurn have given us support, advice, and sometimes bemused administrative suggestions along the way. I want to thank two other members of what we have called colloquially the Troika, namely Paul Flesher and Susanna Gooden. We've worked together during this whole process and have exchanged, by my count, almost 700 emails since <laughs> mid-March uh, to create an institute via collaboration and consultation. Finally, I want to thank the more than 50 colleagues who have met over the past many months mm. to shape this institute and get it launched. This whole process has been one of the greatest highlights of my career. I say that genuinely. One final piece of institute news. Our program of grant opportunities, lectures, and seminars will be fully operational for the spring. <laughs> As of about four, 20 minutes after four yesterday afternoon. Oh. <laughs> uh, stand by for announcements, requests for proposals, and other exciting news. So now to the, uh, the occasion at hand, and uh, we've been waiting a long time for this one. Um, Penny Limerick changed the way that we view the West. Along with a cohort of new Western historians, she drew our attention to a region alive with issues and sustained by themes that were far more contemporary than The Legacy of Conquest, the title of her groundbreaking 1987 book, that dominated the story of the West. The interior west, it turned out, was a thoroughly up-to-date kind of place. Who knew? <laughs> it had been ethnically and racially diverse for hundreds and thousands of years. Women's experience, family histories, community dynamics in the region were as compelling as the male-dominated root and tootin stories of yore. The facts of the New West were sometimes bewildering and maybe even counterintuitive. Within this immense domain of mountains, deserts, and plains, most people lived in cities or metropolitan areas. And she pointed out, the frontier line, the centerpiece of the dominant Turnerian reading of Western history, was actually a barrier to more complex, inclusive, equitable readings of the histories of the region. Whereas you can feel the frontier experience when your car runs out of gas <laughs> and you're beyond cell phone coverage, uh, it's difficult to use the frontier as an interpretive tool. Does it run north to south, west to east? Or when you look at it closely, full of people who've been here for a long time, does it exist at all? Limerick's genius was to take the investigation of and debate over these observations about the West beyond the university. Along with her colleague Charles Wilkinson, she founded the Center of the American West, which since 1986 has been one of the most important venues 
or explorations of the region in which we live. Through the Atlas of the New West, the center remapped the region. The center has drawn public attention to the environment of the West, the land, water, and mineral resources that sustain us all. Development issues, the stuff of heated debate in rural areas encroached upon by metropolitan growth, are discussed through the, through the center's innovative programs. Close examination by scholars working in the field has revealed what every mountain commuter knows, that despite the grandeur of the scenery, urban-style transportation problems clog the day-to-day -day life of those who live in the mountains. For your homework, I recommend that you consult the website of the Center for the American <laughs> West. For one thing, you could take a look at the impressive array of lectures and public presentations that Patty has given over the last several years. You have to scroll down a long way to get to 2012. She's a public intellectual who moves effortlessly between formal academic presentations and talks in public venues. For another thing, you could explore the many research projects underway at the center relating to energy, water, and land use. And you could marvel at how the center could engage these subjects in such a constructive, collegial way. And there's a remarkable artifact on that, on that website. There's a photo of James Watt shaking hands with Stuart Udall. For those of you who know the, the politics of the Interior Department, that's quite remarkable. All of this makes Patty the ideal person for the inaugural lecture of the Wyoming Institute for Humanities Research. Her career shows her ability to navigate between the university and the public realm. She has been the president of my scholarly organization, the American Studies Association, and she's the president-elect of the Organization of American Historians. She's professor of history at the University of Colorado Boulder, so she's situated within the academy. But she's also been a columnist for USA Today and the New York Times. The Center of the American West, where she is the faculty director, is a model of research, community discussion, and policy debate. No wonder she was awarded a MacArthur Fellowship in 1995. Her talk today is entitled, Understanding the Underworld, Hydraulic Fracturing, and the Depths of the Humanities. After the talk, she'll be happy to entertain questions. And so, join me in welcoming Patricia Limerick. Thank you. Thank you. So, I did that. I went to the airport to pick up Stuart Udall and Jim Watt at the same time. And as soon as you leave for the airport under those terms, you think, whose idea was that? And then, <laughs> Oh, it was my idea. So it was remarkable, actually. It was uh, those of you who might be a little, who were not born at the time of these uh, people being in office. Jim Watt was Reagan's Secretary of the Interior, and as he says, well, it's quite a Wyoming figure, so you probably have all heard that, but he says uh, that his children thought his, his first name was actually controversial, as in <laughs> controversial Jim Watt. <laughs> and he uh, came to, to Boulder. We did a series on the Secretaries of the Interior. He took, oh, I don't know what, I think probably maybe like what, seven hours of phone time to persuade him to come to Boulder uh, in sort of half-hour units, each of them ending with, no, I am not going to Boulder, and, well, can I try it again? Can I make another pitch? And that, young people, I will tell you, that is the thing that I, uh, I got so many uh, refusals of my invitation, but I just kept saying, well, could I call you in a couple of weeks if I can come up with a better approach, a better pitch on it? So, and finally, they just wear down. That's the point, young people, is they just wear down and they don't uh, put up a fight anymore. So he came, and this is just a funny story because I was thinking about it as I was headed up here today. He came to Boulder. He had a really pretty nice time. We were frightened that something would happen in a gesture of um, embarrassing disrespect. Our chancellor had just been hit with a cream pie by a protester, so we thought, oh, we must think of everything. So everywhere that Jim Watt went on campus, we had a Southern American West person there ready to leap forward and take the pie at that, which <laughs> did not happen. Uh, but then the silliest story that came out of the whole, I mean, many merry and interesting stories came out of that, but a friend of mine who has a big pickup truck, so he doesn't look like he's from Boulder, he stopped, he, uh, is a, he's a CSU graduate, Back, uh, and he came, he was stopping somewhere between Boulder and Laramie for gas, and uh, there was a University of Wyoming sticker, alumni sticker, in a, in a big car there at the gas station, and so he started chatting with that person. I think we were having one of our football scandals, though it's a little bit hard to keep those chronologically straight there, and the, the, uh, my friend said to the man from 
University of Wyoming graduate, he said, well, you know, there's, there's some very good things happening in Boulder that you may not hear about. Why, your fellow alum, Jim, and he got that far, and this man said, oh, we heard about that. We heard that Jim Watt was in Boulder and that he had a really good time. My friend said, oh, that's good to hear. And then the fellow uh, said, yeah, what we heard was that there's some woman in Boulder who's seen the light. <laughs> Which light, we don't know. We don't know what that <laughs> was about. So, okay, so on to, to fracking. I realize, I think this is a blessing. I sort of did that on purpose. There is no discussion uh, of what technically fracking is. I'm assuming that in this state, this is, it would be a, almost an insult to say what I want to say, which is that fracking is what you do when you have gas in very tight formations, shale, the gas cannot get out, cannot move until that shale is fractured. So you drill vertically and then horizontally, and in a horizontal uh, part of the, the drill, you shoot a little projectiles into the, into the shale, and then you force water and sand and certain chemicals into that shale and fracture the shale. That releases the gas, which you then pull the water, fracking water out, and harvest the gas. That is fracking. It occurs uh, usually very, very, very far beneath the surface of the earth and often very, very far, well, way more often than not, uh, very far away from surface water and from groundwater near the surface. So that is our technical, that is our moment. I'm spending a lot of time with engineers and I could go further, but I'm not doing that. Um, so let's move on here. Happy day here, happy launching. And here we are, Center of the American West. Uh, we are standing by, ready for partnerships and collaborations with you. And oh, well, great. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. And I, I did have a moment of thinking that if uh, our description of the center, if we say since 1986 we have been a hive of activity or something, that's not true because we just we tottered out of the starting gate. I mean, we walked a few feet from the starting gate in 1986 and fell over. So the Center of the American West uh, sets a very humble example of how to get started. And I want to make it clear that that was a much, the state that we're in now was, a, was not the way we began. And we need to be very clear that we don't imply <laughs> that we did anything besides. I mean, it's, it's an interesting enterprise. I think if there's any way that I'll, my trial and error could be helpful to you, I have a lot of those. I have both a lot of trials and I have a lot of errors, and then I have things I learned from that. So, so there's that happy collaboration. Um, this is an arena for collaboration if you're interested in joining us in this, and I truly think it is the particular asset of the humanities to perform this act, uh, the gra graceful deployment of the clutch without much lurching as we deploy it. This is what a student wrote 25 years ago. In a paper, when shifting paradigms, it is important to remember to put in the clutch. <laughs> this is, I think in Wyoming, I'm doing better here because nationally, it's something like 97% of the cars have automatic transmission, but I bet Wyoming is a variance on that, <laughs> that one. So here, young people might actually still know what that interesting remark means. And this, I just, I couldn't fi figure out exactly where I wanted to put this, and I just thought I'll put it right at the, at the start here. If you work on public issues and you try to get people to take in historical perspective or fresher angles or things that they hadn't always known, about, it's hard because there is a phenomenon that has, it's called confirmation bias where you are receptive to and persuaded by and embrace information that confirms what you are already thinking. And that is a really well installed piece of furniture in many American minds today. I suppose it's human nature, but it certainly seems to be functioning well. So this man was my professor in history, uh, John Morton Blum, and he could raise his eyebrow in such an effective way. I think we have him actually, I think it was reversed. I have remembered it. Oh, I guess this is the left eyebrow. And if you said in class, if you had found some primary source and thought, well, now I know what happened. Here it is. If you said that, that eyebrow would go up. And I made the mistake. I said that I had found uh, one senator who was acting purely out of uh, compassion and kindness for humanity and getting better butter rations for, for sailors in the international trade. And I said that I was very happy I'd found one genuinely altruistic just doing something because the 
sailors might have their spirits picked up with having butter and a little bit of comfort in their, in their tough jobs. And then I said to Mr. Blum uh, that that's why I had just picked Robert La Follette as the person who was the, and he said, the eyebrow went up and he said, what state was La Follette from? I thought, now that's a really silly question for someone so sophisticated as this man. I said, well, he was from Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so the humanities also bring that asset of measured skepticism, not cruel skepticism, not, oh, you dumb young thing, why would you think that? But just that eyebrow going, going up. So this, this was not his phrase, but I think it captures it. When in doubt, doubt. When you have that moment of thinking, hmm, is that convincing? Go with the doubt. I'll, and not, don't stay in the doubt necessarily, but don't I'll rush past that because the doubt is in fact a great challenge to confirmation bias. Okay, so here is why I have the topic I have today on hydraulic fracturing. Two years ago, I was enlisted into a cause to write a proposal. The National Science Foundation initiated a program uh, called the Sustainability Research Network Initiative, and they were going to be $12 million grants for five-year periods. National Science Foundation, this is a, a cash cow here, the broader impacts thing where they can't just do the science, they have to bring in humanities interpretation or social science interpretation. So I was enlisted, the Center of the American West came in as the group that would do the outreach and communications for this project. The bulk of the personnel are um, scientists and engineers. And there were 200 initial applications, which made us very confident that we were safe from ever getting the grant. And then they took it down to 30 larger applications, and then six groups got intensive interviews, um, virtual interviews, and then two winning proposals, of which we were one. Well, be careful what you wish for. Um, we'll get more on that notion there. This is the name of our project, Roots to Sustainability, Natural Gas Development, and Air and Water Resources in the Rocky Mountains. There's nine different organizations with some faculty representation or, or from uh, or federal science rep representation. We had to fight hard at our interview with the National Science Foundation program officers. At least well, one emphatically and others half emphatically said, why are you applying under sustainability if you are doing a project on the development of a fossil fuel. How did you get under the wire here in the category sustainability? And we spoke vigorously on behalf of the fact that we do not know the timetable of a shift to renewables. That's very disputed. It derails conversations when you have to say, I think it will be 20 years. Well, it's not going to be 20 years. It's going to be 50 years. Important conversations are lost in that fight over the thing that none of us can predict. And in the meantime, we do see natural gas as a significant bridge fuel towards that renewable future, which will not reveal to me its, its time plan, its uh, date of arrival when we are really over that, over that bridge. So here is our guiding model. And I will say some of my science comrades had trouble, um, had to swallow hard, I guess, to g join me in this. Sustainability is the development of oil and gas resources in a way that maximizes the benefit, the lower carbon emissions, the uh, advantage over coal, and the bridge fuel to renewables, jobs, and energy independence for the nation, and minimizes the risk so that we would also be assessing the, uh, the threats to air and water resources and to human and environmental health and trying to chart a way to minimize those risks. Some of, I'll just say again, some of my science pals just went, oh no, <laughs> do we really have to do that? But we have to at least open the question. We'll have whatever findings we have when we have the scientific studies, and they may, they may be findings that, that have more emphasis on benefits and less emphasis on risk, but we don't know what that is until we have findings. So here are our goals. To attempt what is very difficult to find, an objective evaluation of the effects of natural gas development on water and air resources. Uh, this last part I don't think is particularly relevant. We had some dreams of some kind of quantitative model that would take, take uh, numbers about, for instance, community attitudes towards open space, poll numbers from that, put that in with other numbers on risk of catastrophic failure of a wellhead, and somehow out of that would come a, a number which we would then present to county commissioners who would then laugh us out of the room at that stage. <laughs> it would just be a moment of high comedy at the county commission. So, so it, it has to be qualitative. I guess what I want to emphasize here is that it doesn't work to hand that 
how do we put it all together over to um, a kind of pseudoscience uh, quantification. There are things you can do with quantification, but pulling the whole thing together, that's not going to be science that does, does that. So, and we would conduct research on the effects of natural gas extraction so that we could see the impacts and threats and risks in some very focused ways. And then that's us at the bottom here. The Senate of the American West would communicate the results to the wide range of stakeholders affected by natural gas development. So we wrote that. And then, as soon as we got the grant, I started to finally catch on that there wouldn't be any findings. There wouldn't be any results for a year or two. Now that sounds rather restful, doesn't it, that you have a couple of years, but that didn't seem right that we were just to be sitting around. Uh, so we started doing various projects. And one of the things that we started doing is our endless experiment at the Center of the American West. You may want to join us on this. You may have better judgment than we have. But humor is the neglected solvent, I guess, the WD-40 in all of these contentious public issues. And so these are my, uh, this is a very accurate matter. And, and in Colorado especially, we seem to be having elections where the question of what agency regulates fracking is very heated and very intense. So knowledge is tragically lacking on the complicated practice of fracking. Convinced they are right, people rush into fight, and no agency regulates yakking. Well, that's true enough. And then this is my autobiographical one. When you try to be neutral on fracking, you're a quarterback set up for sacking. You can assert and declare that you're going to be fair, but you still won't escape frequent whacking. <laughs> and that is quantifiably and qualitatively and quantitatively, um, that's true. <laughs> so here, I knew you were on the edges of your seats waiting for this, our organizational chart. <laughs> Woohoo! it's here at last. So, boy, you put up with the limericks, and now you get to look at our chart. Um, OK, so we have the main thing to note here are the five um, categories of, of scientific research across the bottom there. The first one, oil and gas infrastructure out of, out of the School of Mines, Colorado School of Mines. What does it take to make really trustworthy casings and cementing around those casings to avoid any well failure and, and unwanted and inadvertent leakage? Um, also, what are the risks of catastrophic welfare? What, are those, what might happen in those black swan, very rare but maybe imaginable events? So that's one team. Water quantity, how much water is actually going into uh, natural gas production and hydraulic fracturing, and what is it doing to prices of water? What is, effect is that having on farmers who cannot compete with oil and gas companies and so on? Water quality, the fate and transport of chemicals and compounds um, in the subsurface, some of those, some of those uh, chemicals of concern are in fracking fluid or intentionally put into fracking fluid and pumped into the earth. Others of sometimes almost equal concern or equal or greater concern are chemicals that are in the earth naturally and are not necessarily chemicals you want to have a lot to do with. And those are pulled up to the surface and produced in various forms of natural gas. Uh, Production. So that's a team studying water quality, and then we have air quality, emissions of various uh, chemicals and pollutants, including benzene, is, which, is not, which is a carcinogenic chemical, is in that picture. But also the, the troubling question, how much of methane, aka natural gas, is going directly into the atmosphere and is not being, being harvested? And to what degree does that then undercut the climate advantage of, of uh, of natural gas, and then a team, a public health team, which looks at, at what's in the air and what's in the water, identifies chemicals that the EPA has, has recognized as dangerous, and then tries to estimate exposures and likely health effects. It's frustrating because a team working right now does not have 20 years of medical records to look at. So it's really so much about probability. And understanding probability, I don't think, is a particular gift of the American people. So that's going to be a challenge of communication. So somehow or other, all that stuff, there's something really wrong with our organizational chart because I don't quite understand. There's outreach. There we are, Center of the American West, the green thing over there. But we get to harvest data and findings from these science teams. And then it seems to go nowhere from that. It just goes into But we actually. Um, that those arrows are our arrows going back out into the public and into the, into the region where we live. Our focus site is the Denver-Julesburg Basin, and that we have a little corner of your 
of your state in that. Uh, and, but really, our focus is the area really pretty much along the front range where the issue is so contested because of the presence of residential neighborhoods, suburbs, towns, and cities. This is how we got into this snake pit, I guess, because we, it's not a snake pit. It's just a very contentious, heated issue. There are no snakes in any of this. Uh, there are people of goodwill dealing with a difficult problem. That's how did we get into the pit with these people of goodwill <laughs> dealing with a difficult problem? Uh, Ten years ago, we did this report where we tried to do an overview of renewables and fossil fuels, and uh, that is miraculously outdated now because we did not anticipate the shale gas revolution and the rise of hydraulic fracturing, but we did get a lot of credit for having tried for fairness, and it got me invited into a lot of circles where energy is at the center of attention. So that's how we were positioned to apply for this grant. And here, this is, I think people have asked this question as we've been milling around here, what on earth, how do we ever unite the subject of fracking and the asset that the humanities represent? Well, it's really clear when you see it, right? Because a core goal of the humanities is to explore the subsurface subsurface of public and private expression and to search for meanings that would otherwise be concealed. That's right, isn't it? That's a core thing. Does anybody teach humanities choosing to stay on the surface and avoid the... <laughs> See, I don't think so. Um, I haven't met that person and I can understand why a person might be driven to that at a certain point. <laughs> I'm doing the surface, forget all the other stuff, but we can't do that. Um, and then that's a peculiar match to the subsurface zone of operations of natural gas development and hydraulic fracturing. So surface subsurface is an analogy, figure of speech, trope that actually sort, sort of works for both of those enterprises. Uh, it's a prem premise that presents big possibilities and big perils. So um, here's one venture that I made early on when we were doing the proposal. I suggested that we use this format, excuse me, I'm so moved by the perils, I guess. Okay, so I suggested this format for our scientific reporting, and uh, this is, I think, unusual for a grant of this sort to do, always be arranging our findings on what we know, what we don't know, what we hope to learn, and in my opinion, this helps us stand out in the crowd because people on many different sides of the hydraulic fracturing issue do not acknowledge uncertainty. They are very convinced of their position. And so to have a group of people who are, are in fact, uh, as I think we must do in the humanities, because my wonderful friend Gloria Maine, who does colonial history, um, courthouses burned down. She's following the record. She's keeping up track of all the things in the community. And then suddenly there's a gap in the years. So how you would do it, I can't think of anything in the humanities where you wouldn't have to be doing a certain amount of this, and it's, I think we have brought a gift to the scientists by putting this forward, although, actually, of course, the scientists have their own ways of acknowledging uncertainty, as they have to, um, but boy, does that create a tension with the public. The public wants scientists to provide studies that deliver certain and ambiguous and unambiguous results. The public struggles to understand probabilities. There are a number of references in public discourse now to people saying, we don't want our county or our city to take any action until CU finishes this NSF study. Then we'll know things. Oh boy. <laughs> uh, because in fact, to their, much to their uh, honor and tribute to their integrity is that scientists and engineers regularly recognize uncertainty by nearly always noting the margin of error in their findings and their quantitative results usually come with error bars, the plus or minus thing. So how do we bridge this cognitive divide? It's very difficult, I think, to ask a scientist to speak on that subject in a way that will make sense to the public. So here is the first of what I hope will be several solutions that I'll get to show you today, an example of how the humanities can cook up a solution that nobody else was going to dream up. So uh, we can work our way to a discussion of probability and how to interpret it, but we want to begin, and I've been using this in public presentations, stop, in in, stop on into the error bar and visit with us in the error bar. And that gives, I think, a framework that 
it's certainly better than let's show you how probability gets calculated and here's the program that we use to do that. So that's distinctive. But this gets us to the biggest question before us today of how on earth is it, what is a historian doing in a big science project? And I would like to pitch this in the biggest national context of why this is important. Because all over the country, in 2013, colleges and universities are confronting the question of the standing of the humanities and the resources that go to the humanities. The sciences and engineering at the University of Colorado, our new dean says, 80% um, of the majors are in science and engineering. That includes psychology, which is a little bit on the borders, I guess. Uh, well, for me, with my experience at the Sandy American West, I just think, why do we have to operate in a framework that pits the sciences against the humanities? Why would we do that? <coughs> because in the NSF project, the scientists and engineers were from the starting of the proposal in honest, forthright need of the skills and methods of reflection that characterize the humanities. The Center of the American West's participation in this project then, I hope, charts a encouraging, maybe a little bit treacherous route to the well-being of the humanities. So, C.P. Snow's famous book, The Two Cultures. We are so bicultural at the center, well, bi doesn't get at it, quadricultural, quintocultural there. We are crossing the borders of disciplines all the time, and it's uh, disturbing sometimes, but just actually very festive and very joyful much of the time to move around and harvest all of these different perspectives. This is uh, Daniel Radcliffe, who played Harry Potter. And that is his remarkable bodyguard, Sam. And if you read the profile about Sam and Daniel Radcliffe, it was out a little while ago, Harry Potter, her, excuse me, Daniel Radcliffe cannot go anywhere in life without girls, girls just running at all and grabbing at him. And Sam makes it possible for Daniel Radcliffe to go out into the world and not get just totally pulled apart by fans. So, so I read that article, I thought, I know that situation. I'm familiar with that. <laughs> when, when scientists move into the public sphere, with the rare exception, there are scientists who do have a gift for public expression, but they often make assumptions about the uh, extreme rationality they will find in their audience. I mean, all <laughs> kinds of things happen. And so the humanities really are the SAM equivalent. So that seems convincing to me. I'm moving on before you <laughs> indicate whether it is or not. So what brought us, uh, brought the history and science, or the Sam and Daniel Radcliffe collaboration into being, I shall now shift a little bit more to my discipline of why history ended up in this project. Now the most obvious thing would be, in terms of content, not just the escort uh, of the vulnerable sciences into the rough world of human society, but in terms of the content, this would seem like the obvious reason for my participation, because natural gas production is a recent chapter in the long history of extractive industry in the West, and that must make historical perspective worth something. This is what chapter 97 in a very long book about extractive industry in the West, so that seems like a good idea. And really, examples, do we struggle to find examples of extractive industries and communities living in proximity? to extractive industries. Rock Springs is one of my uh, favorite case studies of that. Um, here's, here's Butte, Montana, which certainly is a sign of the interaction of a human community and an extractive industry since the pit ate part of the city and took part of that, that settlement. And now, of course, it's got a lot more water in there of a very toxic nature. Uh, so legacies and residues, we could certainly be doing something with that. Here is uh, Aspen before it turned cute, before the skiers. So there's a mining town uh, defined by that one, one industry for many years, or well, not that many years until the silver crash started, but a few years. And just for this interesting question of memory and the suspension of memory, this is Boulder, Colorado, and at the turn of the, turn of the last century, we had an oil field. And it's now, uh, there's I think still one operating well, or it was still operating a few years ago, but now much of this area is now b part of Boulder Open Space, where a person would go to get away from extractive industry, to get away from such thoughts. But that is our part of our history in that town. And then Erie, Colorado, uh, Lafayette, Colorado, a number of the front range towns originated as coal mining towns. 
Um, so, well, in fact, we'll get to that in a second. So there is a, there's a real, uh, there's a curious gap between the origin of a town like Boulder, a town like Erie, and our current standing. So, okay, so here's the bad news, though, is that that should work. I should be able to be helpful to this team with a 19th century extractive industry compared to 21st century. I don't think so, as it turns out, because I don't know what we can learn. The 19th century, most people living in proximity in the West to production sites of extractive in industries were there by, by purposeful choice. They were there because they wanted jobs there. They were not surprised to find a mine there. They were, uh, would have been very disappointed to find that they're come to work in a mine and it wasn't there. So they are in that locale. Now that doesn't mean they wouldn't be exposed to involuntary health risks and other problems of that sort, but they are not there with a sense of shock at the intrusion of the machine into the garden. They're there because the machine is there uh, and they wanted to be part of that. 21st century, I'm speaking here a little bit more of Colorado, I think, though I probably apply to a few a number of areas in Wyoming. Um, well, certainly more Colorado than Wyoming, but most people living in proximity to production sites along the Front Range of Colorado had no intention of having industrial operations as neighbors, and they saw, they see at this moment, comparatively little connection between their own economic well-being and the industry. There's, I don't think we've, I have not read a profile of a, of a high-tech um, CEO who retools as a, as a roughneck who shifts over. There's not, there's not much movement between, there's no programmer who retools as a, it's not turning out to be much of a connection between the residents and that um, product. Plus, there's been a, such enormous change in environmental laws and regulatory agencies over the last century and a quarter, so the two case studies, 19th century, 21st century, lose connection there. Then there's this thing about amnesia, that we have um, a history of extractive industry in the front range that is really out of sight most of the time and certainly out of mind. So these headlines appear from time to time. Erie, Colorado, where there has been considerable agitation against fracking. From time to time, a, a road caves in because of mining subsidence. Coal mines. Now, I don't know what that's supposed to mean. That certainly doesn't mean that because there were coal mines there in the 19th century that no one can protest against fossil fuel production, but there's something oddly amnesiac about cutting that off. And when, when your road can fall in because of the previous, it's just, it's curious to me to see how we might actually wrap that together, but at this point, not very wrapped together. So here's, maybe this would be a better approach since I can't say, oh, the 19th century extractive West, boy, does that help us understand our times. It mostly understands how different our times are from those times. So maybe this would work. How about, uh, this is a quotation from our first report on energy, which got a lot of quote, quoting. Uh, the West is very rich in resources. The West is very rich in landscape beauty. As a result, the West is very rich in contention. It's not easy being rich. <laughs> so that is a big historical pattern, and that, uh, that does hook the 19th, the 20th, and the 21st centuries together. So, and indeed, that quotation, the working out of that, um, those two holdings of resources, the natural beauty and the natural resources of a, of a commodity nature, that appears on five or six ballots on hydraulic fracturing. Oops. Well, will it go away? Okay, good, already. So, so uh, there is a good way of saying, well, maybe that's what I could do. Maybe I could help this project wrestle with that um, grinding tension and friction between valuing the West for its beauty, as so many of the suburbanites and, and small town people along the Front Range do, and valuing it for its commodities. Well, maybe I could do that. Here's Thomas Moran, the famous painter, romantic uh, painter of the American West, as kind of on the same cause there with Bierstadt, and here's a beautiful scene of, of natural uh, glory, and here is another Thomas Moran one that you see less and that gets cited less often and probably cost a lot less for whoever owns it. But here is a smelter in Denver, smelting works in Denver. Both quite beautiful in their own way, but you can't say that Thomas Moran tried to mislead us or tried to accent only the natural beauty because he and, some, and William Henry Jackson and others did do things that did say they're both here. So maybe I could be helpful with that, but actually now I get to my punchline. 
there's something to be done with that. But this is why I'm on the project. And this is how I keep my bearings and, and do the work I'm supposed to do with this project. So the notion that the study of history, and I think this applies to a lot of other uh, forms of the humanities as well, that the key activity in the training for the study of a humanities field is putting every neuron that you have into the effort to understand a mental world that initially does not make an ounce of sense to you. And I am probably most indebted to the misery of having to read about those darned Puritans in graduate school. Wherever I went, they were making me read about the Puritans, and it was not going well for <laughs> a long time. Edmund Morgan's edited collection, Puritan Political Ideas, I read it, I turned pages, I could not figure out who these people were. I wish they had never, I'm mean, fine if they lived, that's okay, I don't object to that, but, that, but I had to live with them in some way, I did not want that. Um, and then finally, like maybe the third time through, I thought, I'm starting to see how that world fits. I'm starting to see why some of these sermons would make sense if you had those beliefs and those premises. So that is the bedrock of my role as moderator, which is indeed my role in this project. <laughs> they are tough. But they, it's not permanent defeat. If you stay in there with them, they, can't, they throw you. I, would, I mean, it's really a very, it's very hard, um, like some kind of badly staged wrestling match where you just get tossed around the ring a lot by the Puritans, but eventually you hold your ground and you can start to figure them out. And then, though, as soon as you get the darn Puritans kind of figured out, then you have to move on to the Wampanoags and the Pequots because you are so much of a failure as an historian if you just pick a group and go into that world. So, whew, vigorous uh, exercise. And this is the unexpected reward. If you can stick to the task and excavate beneath the surface of the encounters of colonial New England or thousands of other places of intense human conflict, then you are in training to dig into the uh -huh, dig into the contemporary conflicts over hydraulic fracturing. So that turns out to be why I'm on the project. This is the, uh, <laughs> I was uh, cruised around on the web to look for definitions of my role. I thought, oh, I am a moderator. I should probably find out. I've been doing it for several years now. I wonder what it is I'm doing. So this is the, in my judgment, quite comical definition of moderator, someone who leads a discussion in a group and tells each person when to speak. <laughs> that is a privilege I have not had. What a pipe dream that one, that one is. Um, but this beautiful use of the verb to moderate, to make or become less extreme, intense, or violent, that's a nice definition of moderator. It's not very moderate out there. <laughs> Here's Matt Damon, uh, who was in the movie that was out, I guess, this summer, uh, called Promised Land, and it's about the Marcellus Shale at the Pennsylvania area, and it's, I, theoretically, it is about uh, hydraulic fracturing. So if you were planning to get to an understanding of hydraulic fracturing while looking at a really cute young man while you were doing it, you can look at the cute young man. That I'm not questioning. He's really cute. Matt Damon is really cute. That is uh, understood. But what you will learn about hydraulic fracturing will be limited. You'll know that from time to time, cows fall over and do not recover. <laughs> and that seems to have something to do with hydraulic fracturing. But the, uh, chain of causality is not revealed in a, <laughs> that movie. Um, oh, it gets worse, my goodness. Here's, here are two paired ones. One is much more famous than the other. This is Gasland Part 2, but of course Gasland Part 1 was a huge hit. And this was a kind of uh, more industry sympathetic response, Frack Nation, Philip McAleer and Josh Fox. And uh, neither will help you get your bearings here. They will stir you up, you'll see the famous, so the faucet is lit in the kitchen. Uh, and then the only thing, I mean, it's so sad that language is so boring and so dull, but in, in the, I think it, with one exception, when the faucet was, list in the, was lit in the kitchen, it was biogenic methane, that is the methane produced by natural uh, processes and not part of a thermo, the thermogenic is the deep one that you're harvesting with the well. So that actually was a troubled water well, but it was not, uh, anyway. Well, how fun that is when you have Josh Fox so charismatic and so intense and so I'm just an innocent guy and then you have to come out rattling away about biogenic methane. It's just, oh man, who's going to win this one? Uh, 
fellow McAleer, rather than trying to rattle on about that, he takes exactly the same stance. Both of these, I swear to you, are directly out of Philip Marlowe and Raymond Chandler to go into the humanities here. Innocent young people just trying to figure things out. I'm not sure if, if uh, Philip Marlowe is particularly young, but just, I'm, just trying to I'm just trying to find out what's going on in the world. Both of them take that stance. Gasland, the world gets darker and grimmer it does, as it does in a Philip Marlowe, or as it does in Chinatown, which of course takes off from that. It gets dark because there are evil forces of industry and regulators, and um, Philip McAleer, same thing. It gets, he's innocent, he's just, oh, I'm just trying to find it out. And it gets darker and darker and darker, and it gets darker because there is an astounding c conspiracy going on between um, well, just wicked environmental activists are just distorting things. And so it's a, okay, so there are bookends, and they're um, pretty sterile exercises. It, well, okay. Read Raymond Chandler. That's worth doing, I think. But this, um, I don't know. So it's a very visible subject. This is a uh, March 2013 National Geographic on the fracking in, in Western North Dakota. It also led to the oddest form of protest I've ever seen. When I had the governor of Colorado, who was seen as too sympathetic to fracking, by many people, when I had him in Boulder for an event, um, I had, only time in my life, I had four, no, five um, uniformed policemen and five undercover policemen and a lot of the governor's security, which might seem wacky, but it was like maybe a week after the Boston Marathon bombing. Well, I my students couldn't, br couldn't bring backpacks in because, anyway, so there was reason to have that security. Uh, the hecklers, though, were a, were a joy. They were so interesting. The hecklers who tried to, <laughs> to disrupt the thing, one person stood up in the aisle and he said, he waited for us to finish and he said, uh, March 2013. And then he paused and he said, March 2013. And 450 people in the room. And so then I had to do that. Uh, sir, the people are here to hear the governor. It's hard to do that with you talking. I'm gonna have to ask you to leave, you leave. so I'm doing that. But I knew that was, that's what he was talking about. And I will, if you're planning to heckle and you're planning to disrupt things, don't do it with a bibliography. That's not, that bewilders an audience. So anyway, but it is a very tense issue. So here we get to our goals at the center to separate signal and noise in the discourse about natural gas development, trying to contribute unbiased, thoughtful, and engaging information to explore and test ways to cultivate a more grounded and informed consideration of the energy choices, the biggest context for natural gas uh, decisions, and then to communicate when we get the findings, the results of our team's research to the broader public. So, but here is our problem. What do we do? No findings, what do we do? So I'll go through these quickly, but we started a lecture series called Fracking Sense. If you are sad you didn't attend, it's on our website. You can listen to um, podcasts there and soon watch films of the speakers. We've been engaged in uh, intense networks, networking, building ties with the contesting groups, moving back and forth between industry and anti-fracking groups. Um, I have a piece that will appear in a short version in the Denver Post on November 10th, and a longer version on our website. And then we are writing a report using this humanities notion of the subsurface and the underworld uh, that'll be out in December, I think. So fracking sense, here's our lecture series. We had. Uh, four months, we started in February, we had speakers, these are largely experts on particular aspects of um, air quality, water quality, and so on. We also had the governor, there's me and the gov, uh, 450 people there, many heated up, and two people who decided they preferred to leave because they were <laughs> shrieking and had to go. So, and I'm sad to tell you, I'm, I, was a, I started college in 1968, I was a good hippie and a protester, and I loved having five uniformed police officers and five ununiformed ones to just say what I knew. People came to hear the governor and the shrieker in the back wasn't part of that program. So, But I invited her to lunch as she was taken out by the police. I said, get in touch and I'll take you to lunch, which she has not done, but <laughs> it's an open offer. Uh, and then we have uh, a Fracking Sense 2.0 started up. This time we're, we're, it's less about just expertise, but we're having people offer recommendations and prescriptions, and our congresswoman in Denver, Diana DeGette, will be our next speaker on November 5th, talking about the regulation, the federal level regulation of oil and gas that she's been pushing for. Okay, and then this is where I am spending a lot of my time. Um, Greeley, my, that looks peaceful, <laughs> Greeley, Colorado, that looks really peaceful. 
This is a map showing where the uh, drilling rigs are, and you can see where Greeley is right in the middle of that red thing. At this second in time, there is comparatively little drilling, well, until very recently, very little of any kind there. So Greeley is just a very interesting case study. It has an interesting history about citizen attitudes towards that, and now there are proposals uh, from one particular company to put in 202 new wells within the city limits, and a couple of those drilling sites are close to schools. So, very tense issue in Greeley. Uh, I cannot go to a community to give a talk on our project unless I am sponsored by a whole range of groups. If a industry group asks me to go speak, and they're my only sponsor, I can't be there. If a uh, community activist group asks, I can't do that. If I can get the industry group and the community activist group and a bunch of others to co-sponsor, I can do it. Do you think that's easy? No. <laughs> no, it is not easy. So I'm uh, in shuttle diplomacy mode now, trying to persuade the segments of Greeley's divided population, and I am getting some progress out of this, to collaborate and co-sponsoring our visit. Can I succeed? I don't know. Could, if I do succeed, would such an achievement help Greeley take on its current challenges with less anger and pain? I don't know. It would not be one shot. We would go repeatedly and hang out a lot with people afterwards. Oh, and I forgot to say, as we have in this room, I have young people who go with me, and the young people are so disarming. The middle-aged people don't want to look bad in front of the young people, so they really up their game. Uh, there, so ooh, some of you use that power before you too become middle-aged and lose the... <laughs> And this is the bedrock for my optimism with this. I have, uh, every time anyone writes an angry message of any kind, we respond with interest and ask to learn more about the problem. A woman in Boulder wrote uh, the morning after the Hickenlooper event, she wrote a letter to the editor that said that I had failed at my promise of neutrality. I had not pushed the governor hard enough. And so there's an interesting story about my conduct on that evening. So that appeared in the newspaper. She did not contact me directly. I saw my failure in the letters to the editor. Calm. Okay. And within a, probably two hours, I had call, found her number, called her, and asked if we could get together so I could hear more about her concerns. And I said, what is God's truth? Neutrality is really hard and harder than I thought, and I would take any coaching that you have. And she called back and said uh, that she was just astounded that I had called, and she exclaimed several times, I can't believe you called me. I said, well, I did. Uh, so when we finally met, our schedules were complicated, but when we met, we had a long conversation, and this is what she said at the end of that conversation. And she has been kind and helpful to me in introducing me to people, and that went off, that seemed to be going off the tracks with our first encounter, but uh, I value her very much, and I particularly, well, anyway, I have reasons to think these things can happen, because I've seen them happen. Here's my next big adventure, which is putting up this piece that takes what I have pulled from the last year of Fracking Sense Talks. This is my effort to provide a launching pad for more civil, more evidence-based public discussion. And no fudging this, also to make myself the target for dismay, lamentation, and denunciation for those who believe they have a claim on certainty. So just one quick example of what's in this. There's a, a part of this, what I learned piece, where I try not in any way to say the anxiety is un, um, has no foundation. I say nothing. How could I? I wouldn't say that. But I do think there needs to be, or there doesn't need to be, there could be more precision and aim with the anxiety and worry. So that's a curious function to be performing, of, of be upset, but think a little bit more about being upset about what you really want to be upset about. or something. I don't know, it's not, it would not work for a psychotherapist, I don't think, to uh, pull that thing. But uh, here, there is so much concern about groundwater contamination. I have heard enough to where I am willing to say, as a citizen, as a, a thoughtful person listening, that when oil and gas wells are properly constructed, and sometimes they are not, but when they are, the chemicals and fluids that play the crucial part in hydra hydraulic fracturing, that occurs far beneath the surface of the earth, um, every now and then, six or seven hundred feet, but mostly several thousand uh, feet, and it is very unlikely that 
there would be any occasion for those fluids to migrate to the surface. They are under the surface and deep in the surface because there are layers of rock that keep them there. So to breach those, and you could have an abandoned well that breaches that area, things could happen. But the anxiety about groundwater reaching the surface, I think it could be better aimed. So this is a dense little passage here, but now we get to this issue of the leaks. If leaks and spills and accidents. So if you're constructing a list of things to worry about, start here. Start with what can happen on the surface from, uh, I mean, literally spills and accidents in the floods in September, that seems to have been the major problem, the storage, storage tanks. And uh, although I guess the good news of that is that the storage tanks that were easiest to float off were the ones that had the least in it because they would float. So uh, that's not, if that's the good news, that's not <laughs> sufficient. But, uh, but, but breakdown and well operation, uh, fracturing of the casings, doesn't seem to have happened. So that uh, targeting of spills and accidents, and then also targeting not thoroughly performed construction of casings and cement around those casings, that's where you might start your worrying. Uh, because in fact, methane, uh, ozone precursors that can interact in a way that produce ozone, ozone doesn't come out of a out of a well, but the precursors that make the reactions happen, those can't. Those are things to be concerned about in a pretty immediate way. The nice part of that reallocation of worry is that those are concerns that can be remedied with attention to constructing and operating wells with care and foresight, and also being very careful with the uh, storage facilities and the transport. This is a factor that I think is worth noting in this report, that when you look at low-income families that struggle with that terrible question, do you heat your home or do you buy medicine? Uh, the shale gas revolution has eased that burden. Shale gas production has lowered natural gas prices dramatically. A lot of people who have this trouble of not being able to afford um, the fuel to heat their homes, they're a good share, I'm on the board of Energy Outreach Colorado, and, and some of the, a lot of those people are proud and don't want to apply for the aid. So in a strange and indirect way, the shale gas burst in production has eased the burden on some of those people. Is that a reason to support it in your neighborhood? No, it's not that. But it is a consideration that could be in our minds. And now we get to our, uh, moving in towards the conclusion here, our underworld report. So we will be attempting to compare underworlds in our report, Adrian Krebs, a graduate student, and I are writing this. This is the Comstock load in Virginia City, and it is really one of the great ways of saying, I mean, look at the little homes and things on the surface, and then look at the subsurface, and there's, there's sort of two cities there, one above ground and one below ground, and they bear kind of an uncanny similarity to medieval and ancient ideas of the construction of the underworld. So, our project then is to play off that, that comparison, and it's a real uh, humanities enterprise to look at the understandings of the underworld in many different societies and, and to put that into a relationship with our efforts to understand the subsurface with hydraulic fracturing. So we have the two paired forms of subsurface, the underground of geology and hydrology and the equally complex world that lies beneath the surface of current public discourse and anxiety and conflict and uh, assertions of certainty. And we will also have a translation and interpretation guide to the language of natural gas production. So this is the graduate student, Adrian Krepsch and me. No, it's not, it's not us. It's Dante and Virgil. And they are heading off to the subsurface in the inferno. And they are blissfully unaware. They're going into the inferno, which is kind of a challenge in itself. But they do not know. And that, medieval era, they do not know about the process called hydraulic fracturing, but there is no reason why they could not be co-opted to the center of the American West's cause. So we will be enlisting those stories in order to get at, and also enlisting the story of extractive industry in the West. So I want to conclude with a real humanities moment. I think this is a, a good example of the sort of text that we would like people who thought they were going to just 
learn about what chemicals appear in fracking fluid. And they'll have that, they'll get that. But to invite them to think in a deeper, wider way about this. So here is the lavender pit in Bisbee, Arizona. And a poet, a well-known Western poet, Richard Shelton, taught in the uh, schools in Bisbee when he was a young man. And then when he was an older man in the 1990s, he came back for a visit. He, he wrote a book uh, called Going Back to Bisbee. And so here is the town of Bisbee. And here, uh, just before my conclusion, is Richard Shelton's thoughts about the surface and the subsurface of this town. It's just, it's a long quotation, but it's too excellent to abbreviate. The whistle ruled the lives of most of the people in town. When it sounded each afternoon, hundreds of weary, grime-covered men would get into cages to be hauled to the surface from the deep underground. But the whistle, which sounded four times a day and was loud enough to be heard all over town, would never rule my life because I was not one of those men nor a member of one of their families. And because I was not, I would live on the surface of Bisbee in more ways than one. I would never be permitted to go into the, <coughs> into the underground mines, not even into the lavender pit, from which I could hear the sound of blasting every afternoon at 4 o'clock. Nor would I be permitted anything but a surface view of the lives of the majority of citizens in Bisbee. I would soon find out that Bisbee was two separate worlds, and while each world had its own social strata and divisions, the two worlds were basically distinct from one another. One Bisbee, the larger of the two worlds in terms of numbers, was made up of the miners and their families. The entire town depended on the labor of the miners, and yet I seldom met a miner, although I taught their children. The other Bisbee, the one in which I was permitted and even encouraged to circulate, was a world of professional people, business people, and bureaucrats, all of whom depended on the miners in one, w one way or another. That world floated on the surface and was supported by the world of the miners, and yet it studiously ignored the miners' darker world as if that world did not exist. So here we have a fracking rig in, uh, near Rifle, Colorado, and it, it is a focal point in the relationship between the surface and the subsurface in our time. The Richard Shelton quotation, I think, makes a very powerful point about the production of resources and the consumers of resources who may not have any thoughts about where the resources came from and what their own comfort, how their own comfort connects to that. And this is the way I hope we can talk about the surface and the subsurface and the disconnect <laughs> between the production of resources and the consumption of resources. And these are, well, this is not a Senate of the American West staffer holding that, <laughs> that sign, but it is really what we have tried to achieve. And I don't think the scientists could do it without the humanities. I don't think it would be right for Daniel Radcliffe to go out into public without Sam. So, thank you. We have time for some questions, and we don't have a mic, but if you want to just speak up. And Actually, Patty, not so much as a question, but just a project that we're working on at the American Heritage Center. So, archive on campus here. Mm -hmm. For the past three years, we've been doing an, an oral history program on the social, economic, and environmental effects of energy development, really? mostly oil, oil and gas mm -hmm. in Wyoming. Hollow County, um, the Nyberg oil play in Congress County. And we're looking at some of the same things that you are, are thinking about. Well, thank you. For, and I, I will so, come visit. I'll, well, I'll be at that seminar tomorrow. And we'll oh, good. Talk more, but all of these, there's more than a hundred interviews. They're all transcribed, but they really wow. fit in with what you're right. working on. That's really interesting. And I will say that one of the things that surprised us in our planning and our outcome, we weren't supposed to be a research team at the center. We were supposed to just be the, we take the scientist stuff and take it outward. But then that kind of source, that that's a little bit irresistible. So I think we are evolving. Part of the reconfiguration of this project is having to recognize that the Center American West is actually a research team as well as the outreach team, because when you were speaking at first, I thought, oh, we don't actually do that. Somebody else is supposed to do the research. Well, which hydrologist is going to come look at something? Not the same thing as the hydrologist. So that's wonderful. That's a great. Yeah, and, and of course, frac hydraulic fracturing and casings and all that is a very frequent topic. And, and it's really interesting to see how the 
Excellent. Oh, thank you. Yes. Uh, when, during the flooding, just last month or a month and a half ago, do you see that as an opportunity, or, or did that come out as an opportunity to emphasize safety or danger yeah. or both, or how did that <coughs> so, out? Uh, yeah, the question of what did the fracking do to the context of this discussion? Okay, now you're going to see the quarterback and the whacking. Feel free to be. Uh, I'm going to start where I suppose I could just slip this in the middle. A pattern from the flooding was that uh, the press covered and public conversation seemed to pay a lot of attention to what had happened to the oil and gas wells in Weld County, as they should. That water was in bad shape. That water came down with, with um, sanitation systems and feedlots and propane tanks bouncing around and all kinds of stuff in that water. The coverage of the water quality problems was so focused on oil and gas. And that's important to focus on. But there was something about the context of the misery, oh, the poor souls downstream from that, the Lions, the Lions water treatment plant, God, everything. Now, I don't know which is your preference. This is one of these, how do you ever think, which would you prefer? Well, don't let's not even think about it. But, um, maybe it's a short term, long term. Maybe the public health people can help you with this, I guess. But anyway, so that was, a, that was a, a data point to me to see, oh my goodness, big problem, many dimensions. We're focused on, on one, um, which is a whole problem in risk assessment because it is, I am in greater danger driving here on a, the two lane things that I would probably be if I visited friends and um, next to Briggsmore on that. So anyway, so that's the first thing. And then the second thing is, I think it is a very excellent card for reminding us, I guess that's too is a combination of, we should always be trying to anticipate what we can't anticipate. And that's not because we're going to succeed in that, but we did anticipate the pie with Jim Wattis, it didn't happen. But, but I think that is really useful for the floods because it says when we are given a complacent statement, we've thought of all the problems here. There's really no reason to be concerned. Uh, that doesn't mean that we have to spend the rest of our lives in agitation over that question, but just go three or four rounds. I mean, it's, you know, it's John Morton Brown's, uh, John Morton Blunt's eyebrow. It's just raise that eyebrow, and we have foreseen, we have anticipated, and so on. I, I tried when I was a graduate student, I'd go to my room and try to get the, I can't do that, but but it's it's that. So I think the floods really added up to a really powerful reinforcement of that, when in doubt, doubt. Uh, but then at some point say, okay, we're driving, I came here, I'm here. I'm alive, it's good. So uh, so it's just at some point the calculation has, you have to move, you have to act. That's, the, that's really the hardest part of this, because waiting for the scientists to reach definitive, unquestionable, here is what we know and we'll never have to rethink, that's going to help wait. So, sorry, that's a lot. Yeah. I went to the Wyoming range with some friends, and the local controversy was uh, about whether it should be a roadless area or not. In 100 years, do you really, if, if there are more roads, do you think this will be a good inheritance for your grandchildren? They said, yes. I said, no, it's, it's yeah. really going to make a difference. And, and I thought, well, this is great because we disagree on a matter of fact. But, but then I didn't know what to do with that. I didn't know where to get facts or how to produce them. So how can you grant humanities help with that kind of mediation at the right time and place? Uh, an interesting question of uh, traveling with motorheads and <laughs> talking about whether an area would be better 100 years from now with or without roads. Uh, and presumably, the motorheads are going, oh, that, this will be better for our great grandchildren because they'll have ATVs. They'll have better ATVs. And, well, we were actually yeah. talking about damage to the area. They, oh, yeah. they did not think it would damage the area. That was just uh -huh. the Well, OK, so, um, yeah, so the, the couple of things that I would say instantly, which may not be the deepest things, but just it seems uh, well, sometimes I use a slide of a person looking into a mirror, and 
it seems hard in many of our conversations when we are looking outward at seeing the other people as the producers of the damage when indeed our own consumption and our own resource use is in there. And that doesn't mean we must wallow in that, but I think that gives a card of common ground to say, I, I feel that we are speaking what you want would take us further down that road, but it's not like I don't inhabit the planet with consequence and with impact. So I think that's really an important card to get on the table as fast as you can, that you're not speaking. Um, that I don't, did, did Moses enjoy coming down from the mountaintop with his cat? Was that a moment when he just thought, no one's going to like me? I mean, it's just, it seems like I've never thought about Moses in those times before, but it can't have been an entirely comfortable moment for him. And it just, it's just a, so disarm that as soon as possible. I have certainly always found, um, I did a conference once on sound and noise in the national parks, and that was hard for me at first to get the snowmobilers and all those people in there. But I learned a lot about why it matters to them. Uh, I have a story I can tell when I need to build a bridge there about how my, my uh, husband was cross-country skiing with a friend, and they had made some bad decisions. And they were pretty much rescued by snowmobilers who came Came through. So I mean, just something that says we're on the planet together and get that going. As to what we can do for the facts, I think there, the humility that is very difficult to predict the future in exact ways. Um, there are places that are in wilderness areas that have, there's the Boulder oil fields, which are now part of open space. There is resilience. There is a thing where, where things come back or they come back in a different way. Nature, we lost, we, it was a wonderful thing when we had the climax ecosystems where things were in balance and harmony and stayed that way until human disturbance. Well, that didn't turn out to be true. So I think just kind of loosening it up a little bit, I just sort of, I'm sure it's like uh, some form of yoga would apply here, of just sort of take the, notice where the tensions are in your own stance and loosen up those, those tensions, and then see if you might find uh, some soil scientists who could come speak to you. And sometimes the scientists are not always the best Sometimes they are buried into unintelligible graphs. And, and so, but, but then you can be their friend and help them and say, now that is a fascinating graph. And I, damn if I can tell what it says, so <laughs> might you help us with that. But, but I think if you, if you sort of loosen it up and then bring the scientists in to help you think about the uh, possibilities of recovery or not, or really long range restoration. So uh, it's an interesting thing. Or uh, do a restoration project. Those are very heartening when you all get out and sweat in the sun. Mm -hmm. Gives, and it gives you a better sense of what you what you have lost and what it takes to put it back. So, okay, so that's my best shot. We have time for one more, one more question. After college, I went and worked for an unnamed NGO, and I would go in and they would tell me to tweet about the different shale plays. And you know, when I asked why they were selecting action like play, um, it was not for me. And so, you know, then we would get off the elevator and it would be like, great, to save the world today. And it was like, you sit on Facebook for eight hours. And so I went and spoke to my undergraduate advisor, who was really wonderful. And it was pretty rare that he would, like, give out readings that he wrote. But he wrote this article, or I guess part of the book, that was, are you an environmentalist? Or you go for a living, which you might. And so I guess what my question is, is, it seemed to me in that office that there was a huge disconnect between what we were actually trying to achieve in terms of natural preservation or conservation or whatever you want to call it and what we actually did. And for the majority of my coworkers, I think like the idea of getting out, I guess, into the garden versus, you know, it was more a constructed garden. It was this really nice idea of what it should be. And I guess in light of that, I was really frustrated with what I found from environmentalism in that context. So I guess my question is, where does it go from there? If you have that kind of mindset yeah. in terms of environmentalism, right. where it's very much a constructed idea and you're trying to conserve it, I guess you know, my question is, what do, you, what do you do with that? Yeah, so what, what happens when we have environmentalism so disconnected from, uh, well, as in that essay, from working people and uh, tweeting away, but and imagining a, a beauty of nature that they will be in, that it will be uh, safe and constructed and so on. I think <laughs> the baby boomers are headed to the sunset. I think I have, I mean, it's bad news for the baby boomers, I have to be one, but there's some of those ideas are really uh, age dated. They have a shelf life and they, 
So a lot of that kind of, oh, uh, the only kind of nature that is absolutely worth preserving is entirely pristine, and if there's been any compromise, then it's not worth having. That's, those, are, those are yesterday's ideas, and I don't think young people have to, have to take that, that up. And I think their door is open to just saying, wait, why did we do, why do we have these either or categories or these, and so, and I saw it, this is an interesting story, on, on Monday I moderated a discussion which an environmental, an unnamed environmental group hosted and it had people in many different businesses and industries talking about weather changes that were in the minds of many people in that room the scientists were connected to climate change. But we also had many people in that room who see climate change as a hoax perpetrated by research-seeking scientists. So we could have had one of those old-fashioned <laughs> debates over that. Uh, one of the major sponsors of this event was the Colorado Cattlemen's Association. And the stance that they took was, I can summarize this pretty efficiently, just could the rest of you just stop using the term climate change or, or global warming? And could you talk to us, with us, not to us, talk with us about drought, about wildlands fire, about things that we know are concerns? And then when we can establish some trust, then maybe we could get to thinking of that, that term. Now, to me, it's a little bit frustrating You're thinking, okay, don't say this. But, but I do see that there's a lot of payoff to doing that, that there's a, a collaboration that was not gonna happen. We were just gonna have the usual sterile conversation. So I think the door is very open to that. And the, the cattlemen were very moving on that occasion because they had had to debate whether they would participate or not. Because in their circles, you're going where to Denver? Yeah. You're not going to be heard in the cat. You're going to be. I mean, it was it was not an easy thing for them. I'm doing a bad parody of them, but they had been noble and heroic, and I am, I apologize for parodying them. So I think there's a lot of that stuff that really could be, could be set loose. And I'm sad to say that a certain, with the most striking exceptions, and there are plenty of them, the baby boomers kind of had that locked in for a while in, in their, but a lot of not baby boomers over there, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so could we just do this, if you wanted to. Oh, sure, you know, I was, uh, the last. Uh, so, you know, when you set this talk up, you were talking about this idea of outreach, uh, taking the science to the people, which is perilous and fault-ridden, and I'm glad that you brought us around in your last so slide, the discourse. And that is, is that sort of where you're taking the, you know, are you thinking about and developing a discourse around fracking as a way of interpreting mm -hmm. and bringing that science yeah. and people together? Yeah, that's why I guess I, I was puzzled at first when I thought, why did we say that I would be taking the findings to the public when we don't have findings? But then I thought, oh, this is actually, this would be a better plan that I am getting my footing. And I am the visible face, in many ways, I'm the visible face of this project. So that when I do have a scientist who wants to present finding, I can frame it. If it is controversial, I can frame a public discussion where we uh, have informed people debating the, the quantitative methods, but in a manner that I can keep saying, I think you might have lost the audience on that one. So I think this turned out to be great that I didn't have anything to do for a while, and so I cooked up some other things to do. <laughs> and and the, uh, the fracking limericks, for instance, the fracking limericks are universally loved. People who really would never agree on a single other thing, they are, oh, can I get a copy of those? And <laughs> so, so I think I am finding some things that would not have, the error bar is not a bad idea. We need a beer maker to make some beer for the error bar, but on that note, the reception is coming up. So thank you all very much.